This is the 112th episode of Metal Ground, and we want you to help us decide what the next 112 episodes will be. Join our Metal Ground Patreon community and make Metal Ground with us. I was chosen to read the following prompt. White Americans have way more advantages than black Americans. I think I'm a rarity here. It would seem so. Do white Americans have more advantages because they're white, or do just white Americans have advantages because of historic factors? Um, I think that people want to argue at the end of the day over whether it's because you're white or not. I think that the answer is because you're white in the past, and that's how it kind of carries over to today. You know, even in times of the United States history where black people tried to build wealth, you, you know, with uh, the Tulsa riots and everything, yes. where, yeah, they, that this wealth has been destroyed. And something that's upsetting to me is when conservatives talk about how that's, we can't blame the past for what's happening in the present. That is true to some extent. But then the next breath, they'll talk about how important it is to have dual parent households, how important it, has, it is to have a strong family, to have responsibility passed on from parent to child. And we've seen in in the past that because of racial issues, that process has been severely disrupted. The funny thing is, is that agreeing with all these things is when I did my research when I was younger, which arrived me to my standpoint of being a conservative because I believed it was racist, Democrat, liberal ideologies and policies dating all the way back to the 1800s, all the way up to the 1960s, and then you, the purported big switch. But I think it was more so when Democrats decided to be a bit more cloak and dagger about their true opinions of black people and be more uh, secretive and more, oh, we want to help you by, you know, doing these things and seeing them as doing inferior. Doing what things? Uh, affirmative action, welfare, all sorts so of wait, things welfare. that eventually so, ruin our culture and places where we are now. So but, giving... But, but I want to I I get back to the history of it because we're talking about... Well, I just about, want to make sure we're clear. Giving them money hurt them, right? Is that what you're a, saying? Well, yes, giving them because if your father's out of the home, that's when we give you the money. If you're living yeah, in this so, housing, so then give them the money while the dad's in the home. Well, then give them the money while the dad's in the home. If you're if you're working so this amount of hours the, and getting less than this amount of you're dollars, throwing, you're getting money you're from throwing the government. The baby, yes, it is incentivizing. You're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I don't even know what that means in this scenario because yes, you, you're okay, throwing. Okay, you want to talk about throwing babies okay, out with the bathwater? Margaret Sanger wanted to exterminate the black race because she thought they were weeds. So yeah, we can literally talk about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's what Margaret Sanger. That's what Democrat policies wanted to do to my people. So that's why I feel so strongly about it because it is these policies that date back centuries that were built off of the death and poverty of my people. Let's take a breath. So sure. I'm breathing. Okay. So a lot of babies aren't, but right. I am, oh. sadly. <laughs> I don't know what that means. When I say throw the baby out with the bathwater, you want to completely get rid of welfare, okay? Or at least the concern, I don't want to put that on you, you haven't said that, but the conservative apparatus does, clearly. So giving money to a group of people does not hurt them. I mean, it sure, can't. you're talking about a lottery, it just literally hey, take can't. money. But yes. there, are, there are strings take attached money. to that money. Take all the there money. There are strings attached to that money. Give them millions. Make them all millionaires. I don't care. Giving money to black people does not hurt them. And that, and ha that has not that. happened, though. That has not happened. What, what do you mean? That has not happened. Giving, no. it's, it, it hasn't been a reparation. It hasn't been this so or that. What I, it has you're been saying a welfare program, welfare Great was Societies designed. Act, that welfare was built was, off of the idea of, hey, we get these families split up. We get these so people So then let them here. keep the family together and keep all the money. I mean, I go. guess Boom, so, done. but I'm, I guarantee you there, I guess there is so. no way Why that Why would happen. you not advocate for that? So in your, I guess, research of like history of this country and everything, um, do you find like the Reconstruction era and like the failures of like what it wanted to be and then what it ended up being um and then which led into you know which it, you know had downstream effects to, to enter into the jim crow era and you know you have policies like redlining that influence you know how schools are funded the downstream effects of slavery do you think um put black people as ge and generally in a worse off position than white Americans. I think generation by generation, the effects of slavery have been diluted, but generation by generation, the effects of racism, welfare-based policies, and things of that nature became even more great. So in the 18, 80s or so when we had our first black members of Congress, which were indeed Republicans, I think that was a great start for things. But obviously we had terrible things that happened like the Tulsa massacre uh, among you know black people being chased out of their homes by the KKK. Sure. All funded by the Democrat Party, all supported by the Democrat okay, Party. Well, I, I, mean, I need to stop you there. Uh, can you attribute not to the party, but to the ideology? Because I think when you think, regardless of what, whatever the party switch was, traditionally conservative values did not like that's more aligned with um you know uh uh more racist policies it's in this very country difficult like to very compare 2020s conservatism to 1880s conservatism oh i was loving the one before 
So personally, I feel like there's really only one thing that white people have a true advantage over black people with, and it's that white people are less likely to be forced into a box. It happens with black people onto other black people, but it especially happens with white liberals onto black conservatives, where we are told that we are supposed to think a certain way, be a certain way, and if we're not, then we're called all these names like etc. And the worst of all is bootlicker. Because I hate when a white liberal tells me as a black man that I'm a bootlicker. Because then I ask, whose boot am I licking? Because you're telling me as a white person that me as a black person that I'm licking your boot because I don't think in this box that you want me to frame my mentality in? That to me is real racism. And that's what we need to stop allowing to happen to us because black people are so quick now to not branch out and to have new ways of thinking or to go into careers like agriculture and these other career paths that black people don't typically typically get into, it's not because of racism stopping them from getting in there, it's because we're told for so long that you have to follow this path and you have to think a certain way. I think America is a great place for a black person. I think I'm an American. Anything that's available to you is available to me and mine. I've personally never experienced white people having way more privileges than me. Like, I'm sure you could find certain institutions where black people are treated differently, but in general, I don't think that I've missed out on anything because of being black and if anything it's given me more of a voice because people will want to hear what I say now because I'm black <laughs> so if anything it, I have more of a platform now just on the basis of being a black conservative and saying what's not popular than I would if I was just a white person who was also conservative. I agree with the Supreme Court's decision to end affirmative action. I think I'm not gonna start, someone else can start, sorry. I think, I think affirmative action has served its purpose. I think that it was necessary for a particular time. And I think that every black person knows how to get into college. Every black, I mean, you can pull out the, the names, the Oprah, the oh, President Obama, you can pull out the, the head of Time Warner was black man, the Forbes was black man. We know what to do now. We don't need affirmative action anymore. And to me, affirmative action is offensive sometimes, especially nowadays, because um, I have six children and uh, two boys, four girls, and uh, <clears throat> all of them went to Harvard and Columbia and this one and that one, and it, would, it breaks my heart to think that they uh, accomplished their, that goal of getting to, into these institutions just because of the color of their skin. I can definitely say that it creates a lot of tension when you have affirmative action. I remember my first week at the University of Illinois, I was sitting with some classmates and a white student turned to me and jokingly like, hey Xavier, like, did you just attach a smiley face when you applied for this college? And I started asking what he meant and he said to me that he was like, you're black, I'm assuming you had decent grades, you could have just attached a smiley face and you would have gotten into the university. So I was livid by that and I went off, I started naming all my accomplishments and I felt so confident only for about an hour. Because then an hour later, I started saying to myself like, wow, like did I actually earn my way in here? I started to have this mm. insecurity and I started wondering to myself, did I earn this position myself or did my ancestors suffering earn this for me? And too, I've seen it in the sense of like affirmative action taking away from other people who are minorities. Like I had a friend who was Asian and he in high school and he really wanted to go to MIT. That was his dream school. He interned there. He was super like prepared to go there and he didn't get in. And you can only assume that it was because of affirmative action because they have such a large Asian population that they want to admit other people. Um, yeah, I was gonna actually argue that it's more racist nowadays because it excludes so many Asian Americans from getting into universities right. who do deserve a spot and they can't get in because of affirmative affirmative action, which again, like you were saying, was necessary at the time, yeah. but now it's like Forgot anybody, it. <laughs> if you have the skills to do it and you're in America, you can yeah. you can get in. I don't think affirmative action is the worst thing considering all the different types or aspects of a background you might take into account when somebody's getting into college, whether they were in certain clubs, you know, Boy Scouts, what type of classes they took that might not be available to everybody. I don't think that factoring in the affirmative action is necessarily a bad thing, but I feel like because of everything you guys have said, the optics behind it are so horrible today that even if it is slightly beneficial in the long run for certain people. I think we can probably refocus most of that into figuring out like the class that people come from, the neighborhoods, the backgrounds or whatever without it having to necessarily target race. The only thing that I kind of wonder now that it's gone is instead of a black person being in school thinking like, man, am I here because I'm an affirmative action pick, is it gonna be a kid that is poor or a kid that's from a different zip code? I think we should do think? away with all of it. All it's just like it. submit an application, no demographics. Why do they ask your sexuality? Like why do they ask all this? Uh, so, if affirmative action accomplished its purpose, why do we still see the disparities that we do in the professional workplace? If you average white wealth and compare it to black wealth totals, white people as a whole have about 50 times greater wealth than black people as a whole. Uh, 
per capita. So I just don't understand why you think affirmative action has accomplished its purpose. I don't see that. Curious. Um, why do you assume that just because there is a disparity means it's because of a racial issue? What else would it be from? I mean, no. upbringing, economic abilities, Desire skills. to go, desire to... I mean, so zip code does play a lot. If you grow up in a neighborhood that experiences a lot of trauma, you're not as likely to do as well in school, which means you're... Why did they grow up in a neighborhood that experiences a lot of trauma? I mean, lots of people do. Yes, but why way. specifically do more black people? Government assistance programs. Government assistance programs? Like yeah. what? Try redlining. I mean, you can go into that if you'd like to, but let's take it a look relevant. at uh, the Great Societies Act, which was created to kick black fathers out of the home and get black mothers on welfare assistance. These things aren't beneficial for economics. These things aren't beneficial for actually paving a way for success for black children and black families. I mean, taking, you know, reducing a two-family household to a one-family household isn't going to make them the richest man in the world. It isn't even going to get them out of high school. Nonetheless, you mean the ability parent. to even get to college. You mean yeah, two-parent? The, the child, yes, but a two-parent household yeah. in comparison to a one-parent household, that child is not going to be nearly as successful. That child is more disposed to being sent into prison by doing crimes or not doing very well in school. So how are they even supposed to get that, you know, that wealth disparity shrunk if they aren't even able to get out of the community that is causing these problems for them? Something I think that this conversation illustrates is that like affirmative action is literally the very end of the line of a lot of different parts of a person's life. And by that point, trying to rectify all of the inequities that have existed to try to remedy any of that at the very end with affirmative action, it might just be too broad a brush. And maybe we'd be better served focusing on the earlier issues than trying to throw a kid who maybe, you know, can barely read at a sixth grade level into a college to hope that that's the thing that fixes the problem at the end of the line. I think affirmative action wasn't really supposed to like send kids to Harvard that weren't prepared to go to Harvard. I think that's quite a myth, in fact. I think those that have the qualities to get to Harvard were before affirmative action were could just completely overlooked. You know, uh, Clarence Thomas is like the perfect example, um, you know, regardless of what you uh, think about him. Um, he was able to get to Harvard because of affirmative action because, you know, it was it focused on um, finding people that were you know, again like just overlooked but, for those. but things in, ended up changing it, it morphed into something else so what started out as a good program of of, of giving all black people or people um, with a lesser chance or lesser opportunity it started out as that and then it morphed it and I'm not sure who morphed it but it morphed into okay so now we have to have one black one Hispanic one this one that that's and not how that works it, but hey, talk to the corporations, talk to the people who hire, talk to the board members who say we need to have a woman on a board, we need to have a black on the board, we need to have a, a Latina, a Latinx, whatever, on, on the board. So, so it morphed from, from helping us into now. Tokenization. Yes. So you have to have one of this, one of so that. And well, when you start with a country where people only hire you if you're white, that's necessary. And I know that you said that it started good and then ended whatever. And I don't think that affirmative action was perfect by any measure, but we still see really, really bad inequality. So if you're going to get rid of affirmative action, what's the replacement? The meritocracy. Replacement is people need to There's no meritocracy in this country. You look at Elon Musk, he's destroying Twitter. There's no meritocracy, that's ridiculous. Well, first thing I wanna bounce back to is it's not a myth that there are like minorities that are being put into colleges that they're not ready for. If you look at a lot of these top universities, including Harvard, Yale, et cetera, you're gonna see a lot of minorities on academic probation because they are being placed in universities that they are not ready for. They are not cut out for that just yet. And it even just makes sense if you look at how much they have to achieve in order to get there. Asian students on average have to score 450 points higher than a black student in order to get in the same university. So if you think of the universities that have courses, et cetera, that, gr that grade on a curve, you can only have so many people with an A, so many people with a B, et cetera. So that means that the bottom percentile is going to fail. Who is most likely, just based on logic, going to be the ones failing? It's going to be the people who didn't have the credentials to get there in the first place. And then I have to bounce back to- I wanna, I wanna, get, I wanna get you on that point because I would posit that the people who are least likely to have good outcomes in an academic setting are those who have to work two jobs, are those who have to drive there from home because they can't afford a dorm, are those who have to go into crippling financial debt. These are the, and, and have other stresses in their life. They can't afford a doctor. They can't afford a dentist. They can't afford anything. I had to do so that too, though. Those are the That's people. That's not just black people. It's not just. But it's overwhelmingly. At numbers, there are more white people in poverty than black people. <laughs> if you look at the wrong numbers, but if the, you well, actually I don't know, understand what, are the what you're talking numbers? about, yeah. no, no the issue is poverty wrong. in general, though. I don't think it's like who is in poverty. It's like poverty sucks. It's, maybe it we should matter, make college free.
and maybe we want to have, have Furman program, actually wouldn't be that necessary. And it'll get even more ghetto. If you, <laughs> <laughs> if you have a program that says you are under, if you are under a certain income level, this is how we'll help you, that will overwhelmingly help black people at a far greater percentage than it will help white people. Trump supports black lives. I think that President Trump supports all lives. I think that he looks at all American citizens as equal. I don't see him doing anything that would make you feel like he does not support black lives. Um, that's of course gonna lead into the conversation of Black Lives Matter, which was a movement and an organization with so much corruption. Donald Trump not supporting that organization doesn't mean that he doesn't support black lives. It just means that he doesn't support the fraudulent organization that's stealing so much money from so many people to do absolutely nothing with it, nor does he support a destructive movement that is destroying cities, communities, lives, etc. So I don't see why someone would think that President Trump doesn't support black lives. I've heard him say uh, he knows all the best black people. He has all the best black friends. I, I do support black people all the time. Uh, so sorry, that was a very bad impression. But um, I, I don't think that I don't think Donald Trump wants bad things to happen to black people. So in that respect, I think he does support black lives. But the other side of that is he's not really doing anything he didn't do anything as president certainly to uplift black people the economy affects black people yeah i, yeah. I certainly disagree with that point one of the biggest things i what did he do for the economy well yeah we, we don't we can get we'll get into that one later one of the biggest things he did is see he secured permanent funding for hbcus one of the largest increases we ever saw for hbcus personally done by his administration among many other things the first step act which you know there's a lot of debate about whether it was really the best thing to do but that was definitely a a, a kiss of love to black to the black race, uh, freeing Alice Johnson for menial drug crimes she committed in the past that had her locked up. She did not get to see her family for years. Yeah, uh, but that's not like, okay, I did say I agree, but I agree in the sense that Donald Trump doesn't literally want bad things to happen to black people, like I think a lot of conservatives do. So I think that he just says the most pot, yeah, I do think that. I think uh, the mo he says the things that will get him elected. So I don't think that he has any personal grudges against uh, certain, you know, most people. Uh, he just says the most popular thing. So I, I think like Ron DeSantis would be, yeah, Ron DeSantis would you, be somebody that I think actually think, wants black people to be hurt. So by that standard, yeah, Donald Trump supports black lives by leaps and bounds. You think Donald Trump says the most popular thing? Yeah. Really? Yes. Then why do so many people hate him? He got elected as president. Yes, he did. Yeah. He didn't win the popular vote. Neither time. Uh, that's a that's liberal what talking your side point. Loves to say. <laughs> that's yeah. a liberal talking. I'm point. helping you here. I, I, I'm trying to see the logic in this. Obviously, he says things to be, to be elected as a politician, very similarly to how Joe Biden did. Except Joe Biden actually has a history of racism. <laughs> if he said things that people didn't like, he wouldn't have been our president. So you like everything that Donald Trump says? You think everything he says is popular? I love a lot of the things he says. I think he's hilarious. When he said "big water," that was one of my favorite quotes. "Big water." Water. Big water. Ocean water. Uh, oh. <laughs> he has the funniest one-liners, so I love a lot of the things he says. As far as policy, he sucks, but... I'm just shocked you're wearing a Hunter Biden hat. He likes a different kind of one-line. Oh, he's... I, I know, conservatives love talking about his c No, uh, coke. Somebody... It's different. Coke, not c Trump is less of the issue and more so the people that support him, like Die Hard. They facilitate that kind of, like, hate, I think, for a lot of people, not just black people, but, like... I mean, this man... Put, took out like a full page in a newspaper calling for the public execution of five black kids. His hotels, all of his businesses have rampant uh, history of denying black people apartments or whatever. So I forgot about that. I, I just, should not have stepped forward. Uh, look, I mean, Donald Trump cares about Donald Trump. Um, so I don't think he really cares about anyone, I guess, unless you're like super rich or whatever. When you look at his history on racial issues, whether it's the shithole countries comment, the plethora of comments he made about Mexican people, um, I, just the comments he made about Muslims, the idea that Trump cares a, at all about some particular racial minority, I think is a little bit silly. I think Trump will say whatever he needs to say to rile up his base and to get elected. I don't necessarily think those statements come from a place of hatred. I don't think he was ever saying specifically, oh, if, if you pray five times a day towards the east or towards Mega based on wherever you are, you're a bad person. I think he was saying if you like to fly planes into towers or behead people or throw people off of buildings, maybe you're not the most virtuous person out there. I, I supported Trump because um, all, he, he made all of the, he made the economy good. And so the economy then impacted black people, white people, Latino people, it, it impacted everybody. But Trump 
he didn't think specifically, I don't think, about black people. He thought about himself and he thought about how can I make America great for me and, and making a and, and and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go with this guy. And the reason I'm gonna go with this guy is because if he can make America great for and he can make that it rise for everybody, I'm gonna benefit from that. So that's why I went and that's why I voted for him. That's why I supported him. And how does that specifically benefit black people? Again, he has He's a businessman, but he's also a racist businessman, like well documented so. So like, I just. Uh, and Biden's you? not? <laughs> Biden's not? When, yes, when he Biden, is. He yeah. created yeah. the crime okay. bill. So, so that's, but that's, that's regardless of the well, point. Well, address the Central Park Five. Five. That's what you brought up, right? Yeah. How do you feel about that? Well, he took actually, that full okay. they were so, so I have He wanted dealt- them to be killed, <laughs> well, executed, forward, just because just they were black. That story. And but, he, he yeah. d- he bars people from attending his businesses or like renting apartments from all his like stupid Trump towers. I just like. I think Trump at that point was like many people in this room, particularly liberals, a victim of the media. I think he was scared. I think he was ashamed of the things that he heard in the news and wanted to take action himself as a businessman, not as a Why racist. are you infantilizing him? I also, I don't like also real quick, because people keep bringing up this comparison to the 93 crime bill from Biden. That crime bill, this was at the height of like violent crime and the crack epidemic in the United States. The Congressional Black Caucus supported that crime yes. bill. Everybody in the United States supported that crime bill. Mm-hmm. The idea that that crime bill was like some racist piece of legislation that Biden was just wheeling out because he hates black people and that's somehow comparable to the the. Donald Trump's treatment of the Central Park Five that were already exonerated, that, that wasn't a victim of the media. The media said they were they were done. They were exonerated in court. They weren't there. Where, As where I understand it, the prosecutor of, the, of the, the, the Five, they actually, he was a black guy. And so in being a black guy, he went and he looked at all the evidence and said, these guys are guilty. Black people can also be racist against other black people. Or black just make mistakes. <laughs> So if anybody okay. does anything you disagree with in regards to the Central Park Five, even if they themselves are a black person, then they're, oh, they're just they're, a self-loathing black person. They're just a racist black person. If they disagree that with me, they're racist. That prosecutor was doing his job. That's, that's my policy. If they disagree with me, they're racist. I like that. I, I that's think so Trump, is, yeah, I like think Trump has policy. shown a history of ignorant at best and racist at worst behavior. I didn't vote for him or Hillary because I just don't see him as a conservative hero. I don't even think he's a conservative. Uh, Fake personally. conservative. I voted Trump in 2016, just so you all know. So I'm just saying. So I need to exp- I need you to elaborate on if people disagree with you, they're racist, just in general. I was just kidding. He's just, yeah, uh, yeah. You never so, know. Just like the hat. Kind of it's, sorry if I triggered you. I'm sorry. You made no, a point, sure. you made a, point okay. uh, a couple of minutes back where you said um, he just kind of says these things to rile up his base. Um, why does he need to do that at the expense of black people then? He doesn't do that at the, I, I am a member of his base and I'm sitting there like, oh man, this is amazing. And I don't know, you can call me self so calling, you can call me self So you're saying you call calling for the I'm public execution of five black men that were exonerated to when rile up his base. When has he done that during the campaign trail? He didn't do that when he was a politician. Well, he again, did that when he was a scared in New York. It's everything that. Steve said about the comments about people? Muslims, the comments about uh, Mexican immigrants. Why does never he need- about Mexican immigrants, never about Muslims, about terrorists, and about criminals and rapists. I, These are very important delineations to make. And if you believe I that, think what you, you understand the media about, or, oh, it's all Mexican it's- immigrants, I think it's more of you being, oh man, oh, these poor Mexicans, they need to be supported. It's more of that savior Why, complex. Savior. Wow, we're back again. What was the rationale again. behind axing or trying to ax DACA? Were those, these people were registered with the federal government, they were in school. They were doing everything that they needed to do. They had no home elsewhere. They were brought into this country as minors. Like, what's the explanation for I that? I think like, that requires more nuance. Like I mentioned before, I think there were some people. I think Why there were some people feeding him bad policy advice, thinking, "Oh, this will be really good for your base." And he's doing a lot. You're as just a president. infantilizing That's okay. Him. That's okay if we feel that way. But so, at the so end if so if I so if I take responsibility for something, if I say he has responsibility for something, well, then you're right. But if I'm saying, well, maybe there are some people around him advising him fal- falsely, Dude, it's infantilizing. He him. was the president. There's no good way. He to called this the shots what are you talking about the only path forward to solving illegal immigration starts with amnesty for everybody here the reality is there's some 10 to 15 million illegal immigrants here we're not deporting them all with the people who are already here it that's a lot more of a messy nuanced conversation um but as far as people coming in i do think we need stronger borders and actual like vetting happening. And I just want to say, um, in, in Ronald Reagan's day, he was given the promise. He, was, he said, look, if, if you go ahead and you pass this particular bill, we'll give these people amnesty and we're done. And it, it didn't happen. We didn't, uh, uh, illegal immigration continued even after Reagan already said we would give these people amnesty. So that's why we get a burr up our butt because um, he had already done it. Hopefully the devil's giving him amnesty.
True. That's, that's oh, terrible. That's no, that's no, that's base. Thank you. Tasteless. Wow. Wow. Ninth circle, baby. My political beliefs have changed from the past. I grew up in a conservative household, actually, in Ohio. And uh, my parents were always pretty political, so I'm, uh, I always stayed political. I was very religious uh, as a teenager. Uh, sometime during college and then afterwards, especially during COVID, um, my sister actually indoctrinated me into uh, a more leftist uh, position. And uh, I overcorrected a little bit. I started becoming pretty cringy as far as like, you know, sit down and let, you know, let the minorities all talk, right? Um, don't say anything, don't speak over them, et cetera. They would, you know, it was like the whole, you can't speak over Candace Owens, even if she's literally a Nazi kind of thing. So um, I, <laughs> I'd, I stand by that. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of leveled out thankfully and I'm less cringe now. Did and, you? Are you? I cringed. Yeah. This is leveled yeah. out. Imagine if we would've been here a year ago. You yeah. can, I mean, maybe, maybe I am being cringe, who cares? I, I um, so I grew up conservative, but I did have more left-leaning ideas about like, Black Lives Matter and critical race theory. And I was kind of, I was watching a lot of YouTube <laughs> and you know, I did agree that black people were oppressed and all of these different things and that we were kind of got the short end of the stick. And um, during 2020, when there was, you know, everything crazy was happening and I started uh, organizing rallies against uh, the mandates because I thought that they were just totally unconstitutional and un-American. And then George Floyd dies. And initially I was like enraged like everybody else. And then it started to become this weird, like, um, political, like, agenda masquerading or behind his face. <laughs> like, it just, the face of what was actually happening started to peel off. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I mean, I would counter protest BLM activists at my town square when I lived in Texas. And they were some of the most just bitter, vile, horrible people you could ever meet. Meanwhile, like, the Confederate group that would protest there against them also, they were like the nicest people ever to me, mm -hmm. ironically. I grew up in a, dem in a democratic, not a democratic household, but kind of apolitical, but everybody was Democrat. And then I, I, I got a job. And when I got a job and I saw all the taxes come out and, this, and I started looking to the left and to the right and going, oh, my money's whittling away over here. And I said, you know what? After Reagan, I'm just gonna go ahead and declare myself a Republican. And I've been a Republican ever since. My mom is pretty liberal. My She married my stepdad when I was like 15, 16 in high school. And he's super conservative, like love Trump, diehard Trump fan. And um, they had a lot of like back and forth. Hearing the two sides, like people who are on such polar opposites, just like argue all the time about stuff. Seeing that there's a lot of similarities in both sides, like the far radical left and the far radical right, they have a lot of similarities. They just don't want to come and like see it. I started off actually kind of similar to you. I went to a Jesuit high school. Um, I grew up very conservative. My mom uh, is Cuban, so ride or die Bush supporter, who is now a ride or die um, Trump supporter. I think the point of my life when I was the most like libertarian was probably the lowest point of my life financially. And I think it's because something that conservatives do really well is they make you feel like you can always like succeed as long as you work hard enough. And that's something that progresses and liberals suck at, that you're a victim of systemic racism, you're black, so you're gonna be discriminated against, you're a woman, so nobody's gonna care about your feelings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Republicans will tell you, listen, if you work hard, you can do whatever you want, like just as long as you're willing to put in the work. And I felt that way up to the moment where I was losing my house, where I had an ex-girlfriend that was pregnant, where I had been fired from my previous job. There was a whole bunch of horrible stuff going on in my life. And I very, very luckily got into online content creation. And from there, as I started to make more money, I started to pay more taxes. When I get older and I look at taxes that come out of my paycheck, um, I just, I mean, I care a little bit, but it was just so funny to me that back when I was making 15, 20,000 a year, I'm like, I gotta vote for the lower tax bracket, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm barely paying any taxes anyways. And you know, now that I'm older, like if the government wants to take, you know, a few, you know, 10, 20, whatever, how many more but thousand you, dollars out. You just said you worked hard. So I did, but I got very, very, very lucky doing so. Very lucky. Do you think it's just luck? It's not just luck, but the difference is that born into a wealthier family, you can make so many more mistakes in life. And when you're born poor, you get like one or two before your life is over. And that's really sad to me. Yeah, so I used to be a liberal. I voted for Bernie Sanders in 2016, as much as I regret that now. Um, my family was pretty left wing. Some of the people in my family were like radically left, like would refer to white people as blue eyed, red headed devils, things of that nature. And as I got older, I actually started being really outspoken for BLM. I was supposed to be on a reality show teaching people how to be a BLM activist. At the time, I did a deep dive on BLM and I started to realize all of these lies. So then I took a step back. I'm like, okay, what else am I being lied to about? And I started looking at the Democratic Party and questioning my own loyalty to being on the left. I personally think both sides tend to be racist in different ways. <laughs> um, I don't think the government is on the side of the people in general, yeah. and that's just me being, you know, 
a radical. Uh, when I was young, I used to jump for joy and say, oh yeah, Obama, black president, that's so amazing, he's the same color as me. But when I started to do more research, one of the biggest things I was confused about is, well, why is he a Democrat? What is a Democrat? I did more research about the Democrat Party, and sure, you guys are going to pop off about the head saying, oh, there's a party switch in the Southern strategy and all these things. Which is true. Which you may say is true. I don't believe it is true at all. You're I wrong. understand, you know, you may think I'm wrong. You are. However, one of the biggest questions I had was why is Obama in the same party as the people that started the KKK, the same people that voted against the Civil Rights Act, the same people that are on the news talking about how black people aren't able to accomplish anything and need to be on welfare and need to be promoted uh, with affirmative action and things of that nature. I also, in terms of, I guess, of my political journey, um, I was uh, raised conservative, actually. Um, and then um, high school became, I guess, sort of apolitical. Uh, and then throughout college, and I guess just throughout my life since then, um, I think I've, I guess, you can call me a progressive, you can call me, you know, socialist, whatever you, um, but um, I guess that's, I guess, in the area of where I fall. Um, you said that you were um, a Bernie fan in 2016, and then you transitioned to being, I guess, more conservative. Um, I guess, I don't know, to me, Bernie Sanders, um, from what he said to what you think now, what was the the shift? Um, for me, it was socialism because back then I was a very broke college kid and I just had this mentality that everything should be free and I was feeling a bit entitled, like everything should be handed to me because I was black because I was very much in that mentality. As I learned more about free markets, as I learned more about capitalism, I started to appreciate that much more. I started to appreciate small business much more, um, limited government, low regulations. I just started to like that much more. But I would say just more when it comes to economics, I don't agree with him. Reparations are necessary. When we talk about reparations, I think that doing reparations in the way that a lot of people think of it, where we just give it to black people, I'm not an expert on this, but I think it would be more income-based and that in itself, like I said earlier, uh, would uh, disproportionately benefit black people because if you recognize that they are disproportionately uh, affected, uh, by a systemic injustice, then doing it on like a class level would uplift proportionally more black people than white people or think, any other race. Yeah, I think like the, um, mostly like black GIs that were left out of like the New Deal, for instance, um, that to be able to come back and um, as a white American, as a white veteran to get um, a home loan and then build that generational wealth, um, you could not get that as a black American. Um, so there needs to be, I think reparations, I don't care really what form it comes from. Uh, I think free healthcare, uh, free college so that everyone has like an equal opportunity to, um, uh, to educate themselves, to build a better life for themselves. Um, so it's sort of like, uh, and I think um, Germany is also a perfect model to follow, um, you know, by, uh, don't issuing first of all a formal apology uh, which we haven't even done that um, but also just like uh, um, donating to like different uh, funds and you know just I think a more equitable society striving for that is uh, reparations in and of itself. I have no problems with reparations if they had happened initially during this like slavery or the civil rights movement or any of that but to try and do that now logistically it just doesn't really make any sense and like where would this money come from like we're in so much debt <laughs> as a nation would I get this money I'm biracial or triracial like do mixed people get it and like do Irish people get reparations when they were indentured servants I think for reparations if you can find specific instances of somebody being like actually deprived of something um, whether you, specific instances of like the 40 acres and a meal process uh, promise or whether you can find specific entrance uh, uh, cases of like Chinese people building railroads or Irish people or whatever, people being deprived of things, that's okay. But otherwise, yeah, it's a logistical nightmare. There's no possible way that we'd be able to do it well. Yeah, America's unique because we have bent over backwards for decades now, putting minorities in a position of privilege. I feel like we have done so much to give back to the communities that were obviously wronged. And I agree with both of you. Like, had this happened a long time ago, I would understand it. If we had specific incidences that we could trace where people were just completely screwed over, I would respect it. But right now, I don't deserve a payment for something my great, 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 great grandparents went through. And I don't think that white people are responsible for paying that to me either. I know we don't want to use the virg word virtue signaling, but it's sort of like a bribe for a vote in a, in a way, at least in my opinion. In states like California, where they've been throwing around the idea of, oh, we want to pay out this much money to every black citizen in there, uh, in this state, it's like, 
oh, are, are you serious? Because this is kind of like a, a joke, in my opinion. I think that if you, if we impose or, yeah, impose reparations now, I think it would rip America apart. I think that we're already separated enough as it is, and now you're going to have people walking around going, you owe me money, you owe me money, I'm not paying you any money. It would just really rip us apart. Giving somebody money doesn't mean anything if they don't know what to do with the money or how to handle the money. So if the primary issue in black culture or with black people is generational trauma, then maybe they need more therapy than they need money, mm -hmm. honestly. Which conservatives are also against. Well, that's kind of my argument. Like, if there is, like, that, like, generational trauma or whatever, like, I think examples of, like, free health care, um, they could see a therapist and not be, you know, fall into debt. And I think the argument of, like, the logistical nightmares of it, I think if we want to pay for something in this country, we usually find a way to do it, especially when it comes to the military. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, I mean, we pay for multi-billion dollar it's, it's jets the all the dollars, time. It's not the who's supposed to get them. Yeah. Not to attack progressives, but that, that is like the most progressive idea in the world, is like, I can see the headlines, like reparations voted on in Congress to be paid in the form of free therapy for people in the hood. That just sounds like the funniest thing in the world but well I also don't think it's gonna come directly from like you know white person to black person like oh you you um, your lineage uh, affected his lineage it is though like in San Francisco they were going to raise the average family or the average household in San Francisco was expected to pay six hundred thousand dollars each with the five million dollar per black person proposal that they had and I used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area and I was repulsed by that because you have so many homeless veterans on the streets and they were gonna give black people a home for as little as one dollar just for being black mind you slavery wasn't even in california so why that was going to be the case like i don't understand but it's extremely unrealistic to think that the average family in san francisco can afford that that's because newsom wants to get reelected. <laughs> okay but you don't really Precisely. care about homeless veterans right that's, like that's just you, a do, you don't support idea. you don't know me like all your arguments are but, ad hominem. but, you, but you're yeah. literally every single one ad you're here hominem. as a conservative so yes, so what policies do you support for homeless veterans there's ways to address, I mean, specifically I, for homeless in general. That's a yep. whole different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's say that we didn't find a middle ground in there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, but that's a great ending note. White liberals have a savior complex. Well, I got to say, this is a shock. I never expected all four of you to just come forward and admit it, but you know what? I'm happy with these results. I just think it's uh, a lot of people, a lot of, I guess, uh, people, you know, of the left, whatever, um, can kind of fall into that trap of uh, thinking that, you know, black people as a monolith need to be saved as, like, as a whole. I have no shame about it. I have a savior complex as an older brother, and I will save you whether you like it or not. So. That's just me. Well, it's definitely not because a lot of us are really just exhausted of being viewed as our skin color because when you have this mindset that you need to save black people and we're just sitting here minding our own business and living our lives the way we want to, I don't know why it is that people feel this immense pressure to be so apologetic and just always trying to cater and coddle to black people when we just want to be treated like everybody else. We're equal for a reason. I think especially recently with a lot of riot stuff that's gone on or protest stuff that's gone on, people on the left tend to infantilize a lot of different types of protesters and especially even talking to you know, some of the other black content creators I do content with, when you hear a lot of progressives come out and say, well, they don't have a choice but to riot or break into the store or, well, they're stealing, you know, these electronics or shoes for good reasons, you just don't realize it. I think a lot of people kind of look both ways and it's a little bit weird that there's such a complex on the left to excuse like every single possible negative behavior from somebody as long as they're a skin color that you're kind of in charge of protecting. I find that very offensive. Yeah. I, I find it's it really extremely... It upsets me um, to hear that because um, we're just like you. We just have a, a different skin color. And to hear that you have to, you have to help me is offensive to me. I can, do my, I can do it on my own. Well, we have to break down sometimes why these riots happen. You know, MLK once said that riots are the voice of the unheard. So if you are to address the problem and stop the riots, you have to address the underlying inequality that has historically been pervasive. You know, even if you as individual people are doing fine and you don't want anybody else to uh, get in the way of that, that's cool and I'm not gonna get it, I'm, I'm not gonna be the one to get in the way, but 
the, the disparities are undeniable. So if you take pride in having like a white savior complex, what is it that you think that you're doing to save black people? And what is it that you think that you're saving black well, people from? I am trying to make the world a better place through whatever means I can. And but you're doing it on the backs of us. I, uh, I wouldn't I, say so. Yeah, I, I actually do. I feel like, like you want to be a savior for, and you're using me to make yourself feel good. That's, no. That's what How I'm am I hurting you? You're, but you're not letting me have my own voice. You're not letting me speak. How? You're speaking now? No. You're cutting uh, her off. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I feel like I have to. Yeah. Well, what's like happening, I mean, you're speaking right now. You're people. speaking right now in this particular setting. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is, like, um, you, you, you took it back to riots and so forth. And it makes it seem like the only way that we as black people can voice our, have a voice is by riots. And then you need to come along and you need to say, okay, poor little black child, let me help you. Let me help you. That's offensive to me. And, and, and I feel like you're making yourself feel good about trying to tame, help us. And it, I also think that like when we talk about damage, I think especially when it comes to a lot of the shoplifting stuff that's going on in certain cities, you get a lot of white people that live in nice suburbs saying things like shoplifting is no big deal, that's fine. And then you'll catch YouTube videos of them later on being in a Walgreens in like a shoddy neighborhood and they're like, man, why is the deodorant behind a locked case? It's very easy to sit behind a gated community and say, oh, well, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, um, they, they steal because they have to. Riots are the language of the unheard. I think people haven't read the full context of that quote. When MLK was saying riots were the language of the unheard, and you need to address the underlying condition, he wasn't condoning the rioting, he was just understanding it. Obviously there are a lot, bunch of white people that um, feel they need to be a savior, but I think there's a difference between helping and saving. Like, I don't think I would need to save black people, but I would tremendously love to help and um, make sure everyone has like uh, equal outcome, or not equal outcome, but at least equal opportunity, which in my opinion, I feel we do not have in this country. This is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys. Um, so I didn't step forward just because I don't want to broad brush all white liberals as having a white savior complex. I have experienced white liberals who do have that and um, they're very unpleasant people. <laughs> but I don't think every single white person who's a liberal or who is an activist for BLM or any of those things necessarily has a white savior complex. I think that there's a lot of white people who genuinely think that black people are oppressed and they want to help and that's what they're told. What it seems like to me when most people have savior complex regardless of who, whom they're trying to save, it's like they're taking real pain and real trauma and using that as a way to push this political agenda but also to alleviate themselves of whatever guilt that they feel unnecessarily. Like I don't know why a white person today would feel guilty for things that happened decades ago, let alone something that happened centuries ago. I've never seen a white person say, I personally feel guilty for slavery. I Maybe they're out there, I but th I've never heard that. Yeah, our, in second grade, when they taught us about slavery, almost every kid in my classroom would spend their entire time looking at black kids in that classroom. Oh, How was I supposed to not think, wow, these people are feeling guilty for something that they have no involvement in and I have no involvement every in? Every kid in, in my classroom grade. understood the context. People so. hate feeling uncomfortable, and obviously you don't want to feel like the bad guy, and so I feel like it comes from a place of like, oh, well, like let me make sure that I'm different and like I'm showing you that I want to like help you, but it comes across like I think it can land very poorly. I'll tell you what, stop it. Stop okay. it, because what happens is when you put yourself as the white savior, what you do is you elevate yourself above the black person because you feel then like you have to save us. So just stop it. Just treat everybody regular and normal, just like if just like I would treat you regular and normal, you treat us regular and normal rather than trying to save yeah, us. No, I, I just got one thing I wanted to bring up earlier about taxes, because you were saying that you don't, you, you had your job and you were talking about how like you get the tax every, every time and you're like seeing your tax go up. I worked in nursing homes in 2020 COVID. The last thing that was on my mind when I watched 60 and 70 year olds on their deathbeds suffocating to death was taxes. I was worried about health care. I didn't give a shit about taxes in that time. So when I go to work every day, that's what I see. That's what I want to fix. I see, I see you once again uh, ele elevating yourself above the rest of us, and, and particularly at me, a white man elevating himself above a black person. I'm that's he what, called that's, me a bootlicker. That's, 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 that's what you're He called me a bootlicker. Oh, no, I what, triggered what them I all. Hope, I'm sorry. I, I'm oh, sorry. I'm, I'm okay. chilling, buddy. Yes, so what are. I hope comes oh, out I'm of this chilling. conversation is that we're all Americans, and because we're all Americans, we and actually we, we know that America has a bunch of problems, I and mean, I think every person here wants to solve the problems, and I think everybody is bringing what they have to the table with their ideas on how to get us to unify. This kind of 
this stuff, eh, right? But <laughs> you got something in there. Hopefully, I mean, I'm gonna give you the benefit, benefit of the doubt that you have something in there that's redeeming about you that would bring all of Americans together. So I hope that we end on the note of American. You and I, T Y. I, I would like to say I, we're all made in the image of God, exactly. and so we all have our inerrant worth just because we're made in His image, and we should treat each other as fellow image bearers, not just by the color of our skin. I mean, as Martin Luther King said. <laughs> he also yeah. did not like capitalism. I think something that's really challenging, um, I've definitely been guilty in the past of throwing around the Uncle Tom word. Uh, I used to be hardcore progressive, I'm still relatively progressive, but something that I've learned as time has gone on is being a white person isolates you from a lot of the different types of racial struggles that people go through, and those struggles can take a lot of different forms. Not just, you know, was my ancestor a slave, and not just is my culture bad, but sometimes in the way that, you know, people grow and develop, right? Like, um, am I actually choosing these political beliefs because they mean something to me, or is it because I'm black or my parents are black? Uh, if I speak a certain way, am I betraying my race? If I am a political orientation, am I a bootlicker? And I think that it's important when you're coming from a progressive point of view to understand that even though there are conservatives that are black people, it's you have to treat them as individuals and not just come at it with this like you're black, you're a conservative, therefore here's like six or seven different slurs that I can use against you, but they're approved because it happened to be on the progressive side.